very traditional from uh, the setup on the stage, also their uh, outfit. And uh, these two music are styles of Chinese classical music originated in the southern China. And then we will take a very big jump to the time after World War II. So next. Um, so that's the time where Taiwan, uh, Taiwanese people start developing uh, their original art. So we have Taiwanese opera and gold poetry. So these two type of art, they are very entertaining and commercial. So uh, because of it, um, the plot can be very flexible. So instead of telling story from a historical aspect, <coughs> they can tell something that you will see now on, on television, like uh, soap opera. And then we, uh, next one. So in 1980, we have the first, first experimental theater established. It's called the Lan Ling Theater Workshop. So it's the first uh, avant-garde theater in Taiwan, and they are highly influenced by US theater. Uh, the founder, uh, Dr. Wu Jingji, he actually started here. Uh, he didn't study theater though, but um, he watched a lot of performance in uh, space like La Mama and highly influenced, and he brought those methods back to Taiwan. And the, mem the founding members, they adapt those Western methods with the traditional Chinese and Taiwanese theater. And that's the, how the contemporary theater scene in Taiwan starts. And many of those founding members, including Wu Jingji, Jing Shijie, Li Guoshou, they are still very active members in Taiwan. Um, then next one. And here you can see more pictures. And I believe many audience members, if you are from Taiwan, you can recognize many of the faces. So next. So uh, then we go to 1990s. This is a time we called post-martial law period. There's a lot of social movement going on. So at this time, theater is, um, like street theater is a form for activists uh, as a way for them to express their voice. And also the society <coughs> gave the artists and people more freedom for them to create their own art. So this is really the time for them to develop their own uh, style. So you will see the youth theater on your left. They incorporate Zen with drumming. And also during this time, uh, there's many texts are adapted by contemporary Taiwanese literature. And then we're going next. So from 2000 to present. So um, now you, I will show you uh, many stills from some of the notable companies. So the first one you will see on the middle bottom you will see uh, the steel from Taiwan, uh, Tainan Ensemble, where uh, Pao served as an uh, artistic director for 10 years, almost 10 years, right? And so then you will see next slide. Um, the middle top part, uh, as actually that's a steel from the second reading you will see, uh, that's Li's piece uh, put together by Fortier Theater. So you will see like the, those pictures, their style and their staging and maybe the, the one is actually on um, like Salt Mountain. It's not even in the theater space. The, uh, the thing are also very diverse. And the reason behind that is because the theater during this period are highly influenced or interacted with other Chinese speaking country in Asia. So if we see, next slide. So there are 1.2 billion people who can speak Chinese. And that's about 20% uh, of the world population. And many of those area countries are in Asia. And so for places like mainland China, Hong Kong, Macau, Singapore, Malaysia, and Except mainland China, Taiwan has many uh, and close interaction and relationship with other areas because of the cultural and political um, orientation. And this kind of uh, mobility give, uh, it's really what makes Taiwan theater 
distinguished from the theater in mainland China. But even both spaces uh, use man, man, like use mainly Mandarin to create their work. And so um, I heard from I have a brief conversation with a playwright the other day. They also mentioned that actually many people from Macau, Singapore, or uh, Malaysia. They come to Taiwan for work or for study. They end up staying here or vice versa. So this kind of exchange really brings um, different aspects and different uh, viewpoint to the theater in Taiwan. <coughs> and then if you, have, if you want to see more like current contemporary theater scene in Taiwan, um, of course you will see that from the reading, the, the uh, reading later. Also this Friday, uh, one of the reading uh, leaves the possible memoir of a traitor. The full show will be screened uh, at the Taipei Culture Center at 6.30. And next, I want to show you some uh, theater spaces in Taiwan. So first, I'm going to show you uh, uh, spaces on the national level. So I'm going to show you three. They are both. Uh, funded and managed by central government. So we have this in Taipei, next one in Taichung, and the uh, uh, exterior is designed by the Japanese, fa very famous Japanese architect. And then this, the third one is this one in Kaohsiung. And then later, next we will see some other private run uh, theater, so next. So we have, I'm going to just show you a little bit and the reason why I chose them just simply because I used to go there when I, when I was still based in Taipei. So we have Cloud Gate Theater, uh, Guling Street, Avant Garde Theater, next. Uh, we have uh, Huasan Creative Park and Wenzan Theater. It's actually a community center and also Zhongshan Ho and Crown Art Center Theater. And unfortunately, they closed business because they cannot keep the uh, current regulation as a theater. So those are the venues. And then the next, one, next thing I want to tell you is about how common or how theater going as the uh, leisure activity for Taiwanese people. So, um, we spend about like 25 billion in total per year on all the cultural and creative industry. And then uh, on, under them, performing arts industry makes us $566 million. And next. So we only have about like 23 million on population um, here in the States, you guys like now you guys, but like here they have uh, 325 million. So just so you know the difference. Uh, but the cultural events Taiwan put up every year is, um, uh, is more than 60,000. And then the cultural event attendance per year is over 27 million. So basically after you do the math, uh, it's very common for Taiwanese people to see a theater or go to a cultural event every month and then they, the, uh, they don't mind to spend a little bit on the, um, on the ticket. And then next one. So that's a really brief overview. If you have more questions, definitely bring them up uh, during the panel. And now I'd like to introduce you to our uh, first playwright of the day, Ho Zhang, and he's going to take the stage and perform to you solo day. Thank you.
，心中着爱专心想你，想要看到伊个人哦。啊，可能吼、哦、会有别人吼、哦，我过来向你讲话。啊，若是小鬼吼、哦，你着爱注意啊。啊，无吼、哦，你个魂魄吼，想讲留伫阴间哦。啊，我是要安怎知影？你是毋是小鬼啊？你着出问题甲问啊。即、这个问题答案吼、哦，只有你甲伊知影。安尼讲有了解，哦，有，敢有看到？无呢，啥物拢无看到啊？感觉一个，我手摸的这个所在，看这点，敢有看到光线？无呢，啥物光线？有一点仔哦，亲像是透早拄啊起床的时阵哦，咧看日出。乌暗的地面线吼，微微啊，亲像一束粒光线浮起，专注在我手摸的这个所在，敢有看到？像迄有，敢那亲像无呢？我无啥确定啦。嗯，哎，啊，你着目睭来放我客客啊你，目睭放我客客，才会当看见。Angela, vous n'avez pas respecté notre accord. J'en suis conscient, monsieur, mais c'est important. What's so important? Oh, and didn't I tell you that when Mr. Minar is away, you can always talk to me in English or Chinese. Don't you remember? I'll keep that in mind, sir. I just don't understand, right? Why he's so obsessed with touring? I mean. Interacting with real people, live, sounds so 2020s, don't you think? Sir, are you ready for the news? Look at you, all serious. You had better be important. I need to get ready for an interview. What is it? Mr. Alamina was on the flight from London to Paris and has been confirmed to be among the dead. The police are searching for the bodies of the victims. Wait, wait, wait. Angela, Alan is touring to Asia, flying through Singapore. What are you talking about? Paris? That there must be some mistakes.、Um, why don't you call Mr. Mina for me, please? 
Sir. Now. Please. Call him, please. I'm deeply sorry, sir. So far, we haven't heard anything about Mr. Minak's body. Would you like me to continue? Just call him. Please, just, uh, please. Sir. Sir, I would like to make sure if you're feeling all right. Would you like me to cancel your meeting? Good evening, sir. You have a new message. 我现在没有心情。那你要我何时再通知您呢？一小时后，明天还是其他时间？都没有查。我们其实有查哦，因为您的优先订单已经抵达，然后您又特别指示当货品抵达时要第一时间通知您。已经到了。我我要怎么启动
D'accord. Coucou, mon amour. Coucou. Coucou. Comment vas-tu Je vais bien, chérie. Et toi Je vais bien. Très bien, mais... Je ne pourrais pas ça. Camille Nelson, vous voyez ce que je fais Tu peux continuer à parler de Taiwan Ah oui, bien sûr. Tu n'es quoi Est-ce que ça fait mal Ne pleure pas. Tu me manques. Toi aussi. Tu me manques. Où es-tu? Je suis là. Vraiment? Oui, je suis là. Oh, c'est mon pieu préféré. Oui, je l'ai acheté à Nice. Ton anniversaire. Mais il a vraiment beaucoup rétréci. Mais tu as pris du poids aussi. Je n'aurais pas dû le laver. Alain, était-ce douloureux Que veux-tu dire L'accident était-ce douloureux Demain, je te réveillerai pour mon enterrement. I don't think I can talk about your funeral right now. With you. It's written on your diary. Do you want me to leave? No, 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 please. Stay. S'il te plaît. D'accord. Que veux-tu que je porte demain? Ce que tu veux. Lequel est ton préféré? Et j'ai un préféré? Oui, tu en as. As-tu oublié? J'aime tout ce que tu portes. Lequel? C'est Guillaume. J'aime tout ce que tu. Tu n'es pas Alain. Alain savait toujours. Qui diable es-tu? Porte ce que tu veux. Sauf le pantin à l'envers. Oh, mon Dieu! Je n'avais pas vu ces photos depuis des années. Nous étions si jeunes et heureux. Tu te rappelles-tu de ce que ma mère t'a dit quand tu t'as vu le premier froid? <rire> Comment je pourrais oublier? J'ai des amis qui vivent dans le mar. <rire> Elle est adorable. Et des espèces Oui. Tu sais que tu es la première personne que j'ai jamais présentée à part pour Mélia. Non. Je ne le savais pas. Le bon vieux ton, n'est-ce pas? Ouais. Je suis désolé. Pourquoi? Je ne voulais pas douter de toi. Je ne comprends pas. 
nous avons su ces disputes avant ton voyage. Sur quoi Pourquoi es-tu loin alors que notre anniversaire arrive bientôt Tu parles beaucoup en déplacement. Pourquoi ne pourrais-je pas t'accompagner Je n'arrive pas à croire que notre dernière conversation eût été si désagréable. Je suis vraiment stupide Hey Je suis ici. Si. Je suis ton Alain. Je t'aime. Tu te rappelles Can I... Can I ask you something Don't you know everything about me I don't know, I mean... You seem so much like him, but... You're not him. I'm the closest result you could get towards Alan. And I'll never say I love you. Never. Sorry for the mistake. It will never happen again. What's in that folder? I'm sorry? The, um, the, uh, the encrypted folder. What, what, what's in it? It's personal. Yeah, I know it's personal, but um, you can decrypt it, right? Because um, technically, you're a him, aren't you? Well, I'm not him anymore. <laughs> What the f... Look, um, I want you to transfer all the info from that folder to Alan right now. I'm afraid it's against this as well. I'm sure it's okay. We've been together for nine years. We talked about everything. Well, obviously. Hey, what is that supposed to mean? Just being honest. I really dislike your, your hair and your, 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 your accent. Anyway, um, human couples don't talk about everything, okay? It's normal. I can see that. Stop changing your look! Why can't you simply do whatever I ask you to do? Why are you so eager to invade Alan's privacy? <laughs> Because I'm fucking missing him, okay? I want him back. Not just some semi-finished product which says something he will never say. You get it? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't, I, sorry. I didn't mean to shout at you. I'm sorry. I apologize. Sorry. Please sign a contract for taking the full responsibility of the consequences. Good luck, sir. Seventy three centimeters. Uh, seventy seven kilos. So, wait, 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 seventy three. Yeah, that sounds better. Yes. Uh, brown eyes, uh, black hair. Asian. A Taiwanese living in London. Uh, eight, wait, wait, wait. One at a time, please. Um, I'm into um, twins, jocks. <laughs> Some daddies are hot. Um, between 30s and 45, I can't really talk to young people anymore. Um, what's next? <laughs> uh, I don't care.
All right, is it a multiple choice question? All right, type A, thank you. Uh, Scorpio or, or, or Germanite, I don't really care about career. Oh, for God's sake, does that matter? There are subtitles. 500 meters, please. I'm looking for men. Am I not obvious to you? I am sorry. I am very open-minded. It's, well, right, whatever. Um, Okay. Um, system, let's talk to Hatter first. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Um, upload photo, thank you. Um, not much, just, uh, just look around. You? Well, fair enough. Um, I'm Asian, what do you think? <laughs> Look, um, I hope you don't mind if I ask you something. Top. So, why? Asian is supposed to be bottomed? Uh, do you, uh, whatever, do you know someone named Alamina? No, I don't have dick pics, okay? So, wait, what? What? Seriously? Uh, wait, uh, system, that, that's, um, let's talk to, to, to Deepa and upload photo first, thank you. Uh, hi, how are you? Uh, not much, just, um, just looking around. Um, I hope you don't mind if I ask you something. Oh, oh, that, that's nice, but no, thank you. No, not really. Um, um, system, upload Alan's photo, please. You know him? In your place? He's dead. So, wh wait, no! <laughs> Shit! Oh, fuck. Well, system, log me out and log in as Alamina, please. Sir, are you sure you're going to do this? Why not? It's not moral. Are we talking about morality here? Isn't it funny? <clears throat> Look, I um, I don't know why I want to know, but I, I um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know. Are you jealous of these men? It's none of your business, okay? Look, I really need to do this. Please. Good luck, sir. Oui. Je vais bien merci à toi. How do you think of me? I have a lover. Did I ever tell you that? I am okay, I'm sorry, I'm just um, too, too much stress. Um, um, well, uh, not, not very well and uh, <laughs> Need a m more time. It's 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 not easy, you know. No, he's been very considerate. Um, I mean, he he should have told me about you. I I, I mean, I, I I I should have talked about you. Um, Remind me again, how did I describe my partner? A 
that's it? Nothing more? Well, fuck you. <laughs> fuck you. Fuck you. <laughs> fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you! You scared me. Sorry. What bothers you? Nothing. Such a bad liar. Oh yeah, not as good as you are, obviously. What do you mean? I... Nothing. Can we stop this nothing game? Stefan! Ring the bell? I guess we're doing this right now, huh? Why not? You, you plan to have this conversation anyway. Yes, I've been, I've been seeing Stefan for two years. He lives in Berlin. We first met at the gig in, in, in London. He, he's a vocalist. Do you love him? Oh, wow, I guess that pause said it all. You're being too dramatic. You ruin it, admit it. That's not fair, Nian. I'm afraid I cannot agree with you. What are you doing? Over the past three years, you've sent messages to 576 men, 1,211 contains photos, 143 of them with nudity. The rate of a verbal agreement for hookups reached 23%. According to your sex archive, you even met Stefan one time. Have I? I don't make mistakes. Anyway, I can't even believe you got into my private data. You chose to activate the highest level of the trust between us. That's how I know all your accounts and passwords and so on. Besides, you invaded my privacy first. Uh, your privacy? Your privacy? You know what? This is getting ridiculous. Having sex with men you don't even know the names isn't ridiculous? Are we doing this again? Why are you so obsessed with names? None of them is going to be your friend. You do know that, right? Who said that I need friends? You need real affection. Oh, don't, don't, don't lecture me. Besides, what do you know about real then? Oh, right, I forgot that you are just a machine. You are the one who is programmed to be a sex machine. Isn't that what open relationship is all about? Then why are you making such a fuss about Stefan? Because I don't fucking love any of those men, okay? They, they are just sex, but... But you love Stefan. I can feel that. And that hurts me. That doesn't make you any better than me, Nian. You think me watching you having anonymous sex with men doesn't hurt? Please stop it. Why don't you believe I'm capable of loving more than one person at the same time? Please stop it. I know you couldn't take it. That's why I didn't tell you about Stefan. Nian. There are different forms of love. We shouldn't have to be exclusive. I'll leave you to it. Alain? Why we are so unhappy? Isn't being with someone you love supposed to be happy? We are never happy. We can never be happy. We only want to be happy. Do you know how much I miss you? Hey, I'm here. Holding your hand. No, you are not. You are not. I'm rubbing your hands with mine. Can you feel it? No. No, I can't. Oh, sh I, I can't do this anymore. I, I can't. I, I really, I can't. Don't be afraid. Close your eyes. Lay your head in my arms. 
Are you closing your eyes? Hmm. Can you feel me? I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. Your hands are getting warmer, aren't they? Yes. They are. I'm kissing your forehead, your cheek, your neck.
Excerpt one, prologue, documentary screening. All actors are on stage. The actor playing Junfan comes downstage. Everything about my documentary started with mommy's diary. Um, I decided to make a documentary about my family uh, and thought of my uncle, Fong Yao Kai, Uncle Kai. He was so handsome. And we were each other's favorites. He always bought me Coca-Cola. That Uncle Kai was gay was an open secret in our family, and we didn't need to talk about it. Grandpa and Grandma adored him and made it clear that they would be leaving him the family home because he won't ever get married. But one year, he just stopped coming home. This was when I was in junior high. One day, I came home from cram school and heard my grandma yelling loudly into the phone. She saw me and slammed the door shut, cutting off my eavesdropping. The thing is, I know more than any of them. The second year since Uncle Kai stopped coming home, I stayed after school to study. My classmates handed me a package a diary and a short note. The note just said, keep this safe for me. I knew that Uncle Kai came to my school and left. That was the diary of Mommy. Who was that? Mommy was my uncle's boyfriend back then. The diary recorded their relationship from the beginning to the end. thinking, was mommy the reason why Uncle Kai left? Mommy was HIV positive. So that my uncle was gay was just about acceptable, but him dating an HIV positive guy was too much. As Jun Fan speaks, she picks up with the camera. Armed with the contact pages in the back of the diary, I started cold calling people, one after another. Most of them were no longer reachable, but of those I could find, most agreed to be interviewed. Thanks to them, this documentary was able to come together. In the process, I've been trying to answer this question. Why would you want to document this particular story? Why did my uncle suddenly break up with mommy? Excerpt two, interlude, the ones not in contact. Why do you want to do it? A few of those people asked me that. Some of them said that they didn't know mommy and Kai and didn't understand why their contact info made it into the diary. Others said that they did know them, but couldn't think of anything worth sharing. And then someone asked me, why don't you just go ask your uncle? That was when I suddenly realized that at some point, I stopped being able to go straight to my uncle for answers. It was probably after Uncle Kai left Sweet Ma's and was about to move to Tainan. Grandma and Grandpa didn't want him to go and suspected that uncle was influenced by bad friends. They didn't use the term patient, but uncle was equivocating and couldn't explain exactly what sickness his friend had, why he needed to be nursed back to health at home, and why he had to move to Tainan. In the middle of the arguing, I demanded that uncle take me to get soft drinks. On the way, uncle thanked me for intentionally getting him out of the situation, and then he cried. I know that he cried, but I didn't ask him anything. I felt that if I asked, I'd have to shoulder a very big secret. I didn't know if I could shoulder it all the time. Uncle has always been like a father, like an older brother to me, taking care of me. I suddenly didn't know how to take care of him. I thought, I had finals and had after school lessons. I should be concentrating on my studies. 
Uncle asked if I was doing okay at school. We never stood on ceremony, but all I said was, fine. That was the moment when I began lying to my uncle. It was so momentous having to face someone else's complex life. Can't we just buy that soft drink first? Or maybe it was just too hot out, or maybe I was just thinking about my shitty math grade, or about some annoying classmate who loved to show off. Either way, I didn't ask further. I didn't have the strength and could only pretend that he didn't cry. After that day, I could never be like I was before. When I was little, and could say everything and anything to Uncle Kai. Five, Volunteer B tells the story of confrontation with Mrs. Chen at the park. Mrs. Chen, Volunteer B, Ma Mi, and Sweets stand facing one another in a park. Sweets carries a plastic bag. Ma Mi holds a pair of heels, one of which has its heel broken off. Volunteer B wears a pair of blue and white plastic flip-flops and holds a small clay jar. Mrs. Chen is extravagantly dressed. She's wearing socks, but no shoes. Jun Fan watches them. My code name is Volunteer B. I have my own reasons for wanting to stay anonymous, so please don't mention my name. Um, after Kai was promoted to team leader, they needed more people. I was writing my dissertation on related topics and was volunteering. There was a meeting regular, a patient called Mr. Chen. One day, Mr. Chen's wife suddenly approached us and threatened to sue. Originally, we were supposed to hash this out at a cafe, but apparently the owner of the cafe was on SARS quarantine or something. We were walking through the park looking for another cafe, and Mrs. Chen broke a heel. She said she hadn't worn those shoes in 10 years. Uh. <clears throat> so, what now? Uh, maybe we can talk right here? Let me make introductions. This is Mr. Chen's wife. Uh, this is Sweets and um, Ma Mi, the guys you're looking for. Mrs. Chen just came to us to say she wants to sue you for intentionally spreading AIDS, committing adultery with her husband, and defrauding him. <clears throat> is that correct? He's got AIDS. Not Cirrhosis. Tell him not to lie anymore. I already know. When Mr. Chen started coming to us, he was already very sick. And the money... The I money mean, was just for the in-home nurse, which Mr. Chen was responsible for in the first place. You are the ones who gave it to him, aren't you? Your husband's condition is pretty severe. It's not even possible for him to do anything sexual right now. What this... No, this isn't just transmitted between same sex. So that's why he want to share a bed with me all these years. Great. I found it. I understand. This phone was full proof of this sweet person hooking up and throwing sex parties even when he got AIDS. I'll take it to the what is she doing with your backup phone? I lent it to Mr. Chen. Did you ask someone to bear back? If we made arrangements ahead of time, sure. Fuck, what do you think you're doing? Can I borrow that? Volunteer B hands over the clay jar he is carrying. Mrs. Chen sits on the jar. You see my heels breaking. And if you don't even know to find me a place to sit down, really? Some radishes I pickled. I'm taking these home. A white jade radish from Mainon is better for pickle than radish. I'll make a note of that next time. <laughs> next time? I don't even want to see you again. Not even in my life. Next life. A ball rolls by. A passerby. Hey, could you get that for me? All four look towards the ball. Mommy goes to pick it up. 
Mommy had a lot of problems with Sweets at that time. He thought Sweets was making trouble for everyone, in the, everyone involved by indulging in his own selfish desires. The passerby finally gets the ball back. Thank you. He exits. My husband must think that, that he got infected by touching other people's skin. Is that true? I don't know how he got infected, but it's impossible to be infected by hair cutting. So he's just a gay? So what if he is? Or is it? I want to sue you. Oh. 500,000 new Taiwan dollars for emotion damage. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows if you gave it to my husband? Oh. What if she goes to the police with my text messages? So? What would that do? Let's get a compromise with her or I'll be in trouble. Compromise? How? Just go with the original plan. You could have kept your dick in your pants for once in your life. Mrs. Chen, can I borrow that phone for just a second? Is my husband gay? I don't know. Then why did he come to you? And to you, his little boyfriend? We just met him at the hospital. He's gay, isn't he? Oh, why wouldn't he share my bag? Please stay calm. Mr. Chen's illness has nothing to do with these two. Oh, yeah? Then I dare you test your virus. My lawyer said he can test your virus and see if it's the same as my husband's. Then they can tell if you gave it to him. Do they test it? Don't worry. I always suspected that he was a woman. People congratulate me for marrying such a handsome, sophisticated husband. But they don't know how bad he is in the bed. <laughs> During the conversation, a few people have started doing Tai Chi in the park. I didn't know until later that all she wanted was to prove that her husband was gay. That way she has an excuse for why her husband wasn't interested in her sexually, why they had separate bedrooms. But even if that's so, it doesn't mean Mr. Chen was gay. When I said this to Mommy, he didn't want to hear it. He was really mad at sweets. So you want to compromise with this woman? It's not the first time this happened. There, there was someone engaged and threatened to go public with my thing. She like broke up with him. Wow, really? Yeah. If you're sick, you're an easy target for bullying, especially our kind of sick. Why have I never been threatened? Why is it always you? Isn't it because you're doing unethical things? What did you say? Tai Chi students. Uh, excuse me, we have group training here at this time. Can you move over to the side a little bit? So should I carry you over there? I can do it too. No. I'll walk. I don't want you pressing up on my outfit. It's very expensive. <clears throat> Auntie, do you always go out all dressed up and pretty like that? I hardly even meet strangers. I'm not going to lose you in style. Of course. I need to dress up nice. Even when you think I'm a crazy lady. I want to be a beautiful crazy lady. <laughs> if you can tell that I look good in this outfit, you probably not like it. Volunteer B clumsily tries to help Mrs. Chen up. We'll go put this in the compost pile first. I helped Mrs. Chen over to a pagoda in the park, and Mommy called Mr. Chen at the hospital trying to figure things out. <laughs> Mr. Chen couldn't speak for more than a few sentences without losing his breath, but he begged on the phone. Mr. Chen, please help me lie, lie to her. I, I have kids and family. He hangs up. Just this time, do it for him. It goes against everything we stand for to agree with her and say that you can get infected by cutting hair. So you don't care what happens to me at all? I, if she reads my text messages, anyone who's ever had sex with me could sue me for attempted murder, you know? 
from that damned Article 21. So why do you have to sleep around so much? I thought you wanted to find someone long term too. It's not that easy. I'm not you. So what? You're gonna agree with this kind of bull and add to the prejudice? Infected via haircut. That's as stupid as saying you can get infected by touching blood on blood soaked broken glass in a telephone booth. Yeah, especially from you. So you want me to go to jail? Or get them tied up in court for years? You know, I was the one who told Mr. Chen about the haircut excuse. If you don't want people to know, you need to make something up. This world never awarded anyone for being honest anyway. Uh, let's wait for them here. No matter what, I'm still the woman who spent a lifetime in China. He bought so many different kinds of insurance for me and the kids. It used to be super cheap to do that. Now that our kids have grown up, he has his own life to live. If he had told me sooner, I would have done research for him and kept him from getting sick. We've been married for so long. I really don't want him to get that. So I'm um, picking up. Auntie, what if, what if your husband isn't gay? Why would he do it to me? Mrs. Chen starts crying. I think I might have opened the can of worms. Mm -hmm. Maybe no matter how old she got, Mrs. Chen couldn't understand why her man was never turned on by her. I knew that their marriage was mostly arranged. Mrs. Chen wasn't that attractive, and Mr. Chen was very handsome. I can't be sure what upset Mrs. Chen more, that her husband was dying, that her husband was gay, or that her husband wasn't gay, just never loved her. Jun Fan reads from the diary. Mr. Chen's death changed many things. I complained about sweets to Kai, but unbelievably, Kai took his side and said we should grant the dying man's wish and protect sweets from trouble. I couldn't understand the hypocrisy and complacency of sweets and Kai. They convinced Mrs. Chen and Mr. Chen that Mr. Chen contracted AIDS by cutting hair, that Mr. Chen was innocent and deserves compassion that he wasn't gay and wasn't sleeping with hookers either. Mrs. Chen went away satisfied and I didn't speak to either of them for a month. Sweets never learned his lesson and was the same as ever. Then we had our first big fight. Dark room, music, techno beats pumping, bodies clinging in abandonment and desire. Ma Mi drags Sweets out of the room while the abandonment and desire continue inside. How many more Mrs. Chen's do you want to deal with? Why can't you have some self-control? Why should I have to control this? Because we didn't establish this place so you can just arrange group fucks. What exactly do you think you're doing? Are you having a good time? I'm not doing this to have a good time. I can't stop it. Why do you want this kind of life? I am just horny. Anything wrong with that? What about the guy that you were like before? Players will be players. Whether I'm sick or not, this is who I am. I want to change who I am just because I'm sick. I confessed to him and he left. Not everyone is lucky like you. Well, as long as you're living this kind of life, you'll never find the right person. What about you? How long can Kai stand this Puritan lifestyle you've adopted? You even wear condoms for blowjobs just because the doctor said so. What, are you eating plastic now? <laughs> Fuck you, who told you that? <clears throat> who else? Why would he tell you about this? I'm doing you a big right. You can't keep this going indefinitely, can you? Model couple. Mommy punches sweets. Even if men contract a fatal illness and have one day to live, it wouldn't make their souls more noble. They are not Jesus. This is the first time Mommy mentioned Jesus in his diary. A few people sit around singing hymns. A phone rings. Jun Fan gestures as though she's interviewing Sister Ma with the camera pointed at her. The camera separates them. 
can have found them with that name. He only uses his real name, Ma Tai Shang now. I'm his older sister. This was so long ago. I think you can ask my brother what he thinks about it right now. His old crowd has always painted him as a traitor, said he did them wrong, especially now he's with the church. But it's hard to say what's in store for someone who, throughout his life. It's not possible to always maintain the same identity and keep giving. Him and his friends from the past, they were together all the time, living amongst the same group. They were too tightly integrated and too full of emotional and romantic entanglements to the point where even a good thing became bad. Couldn't you have concentrated on getting better from the disease and working and protesting when it's time to protest? Where do they get the strength and the time of the day to love and hate and vilify like that? But now he just smiles and says it's all in the past. But hey, I I've always known that our Mon Tai Shang no matter how you call his names, he wouldn't say anything. Ma Tai Shang is a very gentle spirit. When we were little, one day we were having dinner and a commercial came on TV about how African children were starving. So Ma Tai Shang took the food out of his bowl and put it in a cardboard box so he could send it to Africa and send it to the children. Nobody could reason him out of it until the grown-ups finally gave up and spanked him until he cried. Then he fi fished the food out of the box and ate it. <laughs> Truly, that's how a good person he is from the beginning. Of course, we're all hurting for him when he kept meeting bad people. Your uncle had good manners at least, but the first one, the one who gave it to him, that one was such scum. I'm still mad thinking about it. Tai Shang didn't dare tell us when he got sick because we're a religious family. He, he regrets that now. If he had known Jesus' love earlier, he wouldn't need to be afraid to tell us and wouldn't have suffered on his own for so long. Oh, and I, I always feel like I'm the one who made him sick. My family used to own a karaoke place, a garden style with wood cabins and individual party rooms. There are some really good times. The food we served was famous in the nation and our most prosperous, as soon as you get a party room, we serve you three piping hot Taiwanese stir fry dishes and half a dozen beers on the house. It was extremely profitable for a while. And then local folks started using rooms like hourly motels and rumors started flying. You know, when some people go to motels, people talk. If it's one married person, one single person, or one old one with youth, think of how bad it looks. I mean, at first we just pretended not to see things. It's not like we can interfere with them with what customers do in the privacy of the rooms, right? But young people stopped coming, and a holiday karaoke opened up. We hung out for a while, but eventually had to close. Really, no good can come when you come down bad things. After that, my parents started making pastries and selling them to the church near the, the old family home. And the church did order a lot from them. And Tai Shang and I would go help out at the church when we went home for the weekend. The church truly put us back on our feet. Tai Shang and I share a small studio in Taipei. We were not well off. When you live together, you're going to have some small tips. Sister and mommy face off at a doorway. Fine, I was supposed to buy toilet paper. I'll do it now. It's always this late when I get home from work and you always forget. What have you been doing? I thought midterms are done. It's fine, it's fine. He says if your boyfriend's coming to see you, he can stay. I'll just go crash with some friends. It's just too much trouble. What, is that an apology? I have friends too. 
Mommy leaves. A boy comes in and embraces sister. Mommy hears sounds of lovers next door. A woman. So go mountain climbing. Go ahead. That's all you think about, mountain climbing. A man. What's wrong with mountain climbing? Why are you acting like I don't take home the dough? Go ahead and take your parents, too. Go and don't come back. Noises of shoveling and pulling. Silence descends. So you're not going? There are mountains right at home. Why do I need to go so far to climb others? Dabajin Mountain, Jin Mountain, Mount Hehuan, <laughs> Snow Mountain, Fire Mountain, ooh, Jade Mountain, <laughs> so high. You'll take the high road and I'll take the low road. Oh, stop it, you fucker. Aren't we out of condoms? Or maybe we should stop. Okay, let's stop. What's your hand doing? So stop. I thought you want to stop, what? Fine, I'm not in the danger zone today. We'll get plan B tomorrow, like you're planning anyway, fucker. As Mommy walks, the exaggerated noise of the couple's lovemaking follows him. I think I was the one that got my brother sick. <clears throat> you see, if the holiday karaoke didn't open a branch in our town, and the family business didn't close, I wouldn't have needed to squeeze in that studio with him, and Tai Xing wouldn't have gone to stay with his friends and known that guy. Hey, don't tell him I say these things. he only get upset if you ask him. You just say he didn't feel so beaten down at first. It's me talking about it that makes him feel like he's in a bad situation. I am so glad he's back on the right track now. It's, it's not like we disagree with people being gay. We just disagree with their lifestyle. Uh, what do you mean <coughs> by the right track? He came to me one day, out of blue, came to the church. But before then, he would just call me every two or three months, but wouldn't talk about his life. I knew he was in a very bad mood that day before. Sis. <clears throat> well, hi, you're here. It's such a rare occasion. It's not that rare, is it? How have you been? Is he at work? Yeah, fine. Just wanted to come by and see how you're doing. You want to chat after communion? Mm -hmm. Several people sit in a circle singing hymns. Mommy sits with them, reading messages between him and Kai. A message from Mommy. What does model couple mean? A message from Kai, not volunteer B. What do you mean what it means? You know. Hey, that's not what I meant. It's just, there are things I can't even touch upon without you getting upset. Yeah? Like what? What did you talk about that I can't know? It's nothing, really. Are you in love with him? No. You love me? Mm -hmm. Why did it take you so long to respond? <laughs> Look at you, pushing again. No, I just... I want you to spell this out for me. For some things, there's no way to be so crystal clear. That just makes me feel unsettled. I feel like I'm doing my best to accommodate you, but you're not doing the same. What do you mean? For example, sometimes I want you to come inside, or I want to swallow. You didn't need to wipe things down so aggressively like you're afraid. You knew I would like this from the beginning. Yes, and I do what you want me to do. So go find someone normal. That's not what I meant. I just think that if you're preoccupied with being afraid, it makes things less smooth. I switched meds recently, and the virus count is backed up. You know that. It's not just recently, and it's not just about sex. So what is it? I feel like I have to be all about you. Of course, it's what I signed up for, you know? Go to bed early, get up early, have a healthy lifestyle, and maintain a certain good image with your, within your circle of friends. So, 
It's your bad luck to have a boyfriend like me. I'm not saying that. I just don't like it when you talk about me finding a normal person instead. Just the nuclear option and nothing else. This is who I am. Take it or leave it. No room for discussion at all. So why do you go to Sweets? Okay, I am sorry, but who else can I talk to but him? Should I, should I grab a rando off the streets and out you? Okay, you want to talk? Let's talk. Do you like hanging out with him? That's not it. What is it then? I just need some air. <sighs> Sounds to me like you just need to have someone come in you. I can't do this with you right now. I'm working. Just calm down a little. Is it boring having sex with me? Pause. In the music of the hymns, Ma Me starts crying. <coughs> the churchgoers hold Ma Me's hands. Churchgoers. In the godly melodies, God shows us his pity and love. We have a new brother today who came in with the pain of this world. We know not of his pain, but the almighty God knows. He will point the way for you. Amen. The singing stops. Sound of text messages. On stage, the scene is frozen. Hello. Kai's ex. Who's this? I am Fang Yeo Kai's boyfriend. Is this a good time? You may not remember this, but we ran into you two or three years ago at a nightclub. You were on duty. Oh, yes, I ran into Yao Kai that day. Uh, what is it? Do Kai's relationships tend to um, overlap? Why is it so easy for regular people to stay together for the rest of their lives, and so hard for gay people? Why must they have so much sex? Is it for, uh, to prove their popularity? I think Ma Tai Chang was just interested in loving one person and being with him. Well, I'll never understand these things. I have a feeling. Being in that circle brought him a lot of pain. I tried to make it up to him as much as I can, since he was so distant for such a long time. Anyway. Uh, but what if gay people and patients can be like others and not seem differently when they fall in love, get married, break up, and get sick? Maybe things between my uncle and Uncle Ma would have been different. Uh, it's just something I was thinking about. I haven't talked to my uncle about it or anything. I don't know. I can only consider things from my brother's point of view. My brother didn't do anyone wrong. And just because he has the same sickness as these people, doesn't mean he has to be around them forever. You know how when someone is hurt, especially relationship-wise, they get out of control from time to time, and he's lost all his friends because of it. He's learned his lesson. But there's one thing I have to ask you about. When my family was nearly bankrupt, when Ma Taishin was in so much pain, it was our brothers and sisters at church who stood up next to us, not any one of his gay friends from the past. But, uh, that's it's okay. He, he had to pick a side eventually. He blew up his friends, and he blew up with his friends, and I knew about it. I don't blame anyone, and Tai Shane just broke away from them completely. Here, use this email. You can reach him this way. Thank you. Thank you for speaking to him. Oh, uh, why thank me? It's good to know he's still remembered by, by friends from the past. I could never forgive, forget him. The scene changes, morphing into sweet maws at the police raid. A few men are being jerked around by the police. The last day of Sweet Ma's, I was there, and so were a bunch of cops. End of excerpt.
right away to the panel in case you know you have to go or have another place where this is a good time now, so don't worry the thrill that you came. But if you want to stay to hear from the playwrights and uh, from our panelists, uh, uh, please do so. Yes, this is not only that we uh, that you hear us, but it also will be um, recorded. This is why we have this, and we have still a moment of time to, to take some questions. Also, please speak into the mic. So, first of all, I think um, uh, thank you, a big thank you to, to the writers coming over, for the director also for um, for um, uh, directing um, this. What Knut did, and uh, congratulations. So, I think another round of applause. <laughs> So as you could see, uh, these were just um, excerpts, you know, one of the search, you know, most of identities and uh, artificial intelligence and emails and the shelter that's been broken up. And um, so um, before we come to our, our artist, maybe a question um, to, to Jim, who is here also a professor at the Graduate Center CUNY and who has monitored and written and researched the scene here, perhaps a bit more in the Western world. What comes to your mind? Where does that fit in when you hear those? plays? Well, uh, first of all, I also want to congratulate you. I thought the plays were really terrific, really interesting ideas. Uh, I loved the way that you dealt with um, desire, politics, identity, family, um, really stimulating. A uh, couple of things that came to my mind while I was watching these. Um, the first thing was um, the importance of seeing gay lives on stage. Um, I don't know if you followed, but um, even in the 21st century, having uh, gay issues and gay lives presented on stage can be considered dangerous and corruptible. In Hungary, just this past week, uh, a Broadway musical that had uh, originated in London, played uh, Broadway, uh, had gotten a production in Budapest, uh, Billy Elliot um, came under fire from the homophobic government and um, it was closed and if you've seen Billy Elliot, it was considered a family musical, uh, but there is a gay character in it uh, and I saw the production um, two years ago and they had completely whitewashed much of the gay material, but it was closed um, essentially because there was a belief that uh, it could turn children gay was the uh, response to it. So I think it's very important that we see these stories presented. The other thing that came to my mind while I was watching this, um, I um, see a lot of theater. I see uh, a good deal of queer theater, not to discount the um, experimental queer theater in New York, which there is a good deal. And um, uh, there are places like La Mama, we saw Taylor Mac, um, uh, represented in the introduction, and Dixon Place has the Hot Festival uh, coming up. So there will be some really interesting experimental theater. But I was just thinking about the current um, queer theater offerings. If you were to choose a uh, LGBT play tonight, 
uh, these would be your primary choices. Uh, you could see a wonderful, don't get me wrong, wonderful production of Angels in America, uh, which is now 25 years old. Uh, you can also see a terrific production of The Boys of Band, um, which was from 1968, and at the time was considered quite radical. Uh, so there's a good deal of nostalgia around queer theater now. And um, just moving a little bit off Broadway, a couple of plays I saw in the last week, uh, there's a play called Skin Tight, in which um, explores a family reaction to a 70-year-old man having a relationship with a 20-year-old man. Uh, and there's a play that opened last night called Log Cabin, uh, which looks at some of the contemporary issues of um, what it means to be gay or lesbian in 2018 after the marriage laws have passed. Uh, one of the things that I also want to point out, I won't take any more time, uh, these are all by uh, white men, uh, which I think is uh, pretty typical. Um, so I applaud Taiwan for these wonderful progressive politics, but don't let your theater become boring as it has become here in terms of our queer theater. So uh, I will end with that just to uh, say, as I, um, as I mentioned earlier, that it was really just very exciting to see this stimulating work that really challenges us in ways I don't think uh, gay theater is at this point. Yeah, thank you, and for sure it is uh, not boring and uh, very uh, contemporary. Um, maybe, uh, Liang, tell us a bit, how, how, do, how does it feel to hear an excerpt from your uh, work about the shelter that was closed on, how does it feel to hear it here on stage? Uh, <coughs> okay, I speak in Chinese, okay? And, and he will <laughs> translate for me, okay? Uh, I think, uh, when I was reading the book, when I was in my mind, I was the first time I was in the book. And then, I was thinking about it, that when I was in the Taiwan situation, and I was wondering if I could translate it into a language, if I could translate it, 传达我原本想要传达的东西，但我觉得其实他们就是就是其实，呃，我觉得他们表现的还蛮好的。然后其实导演也有去处理关于就是同时在做纪录片跟跟过去的这个交错的的这个现场的处理，所以我就觉得哎，就是其实看的时候会觉得他们用很很简单的方式，然后去去做那个呈现。Sorry, too long. Hello. So in the beginning, she was um, instantly recalling the production that was in Taiwan, and she started to think about, you know, this play was highly uh, emphasis on the Taiwanese scenario in the gay um, culture, and she was wondering if uh, during the process of translating the entire play, uh, we would lose the we would lose the very idea of this play that tries to convey. However, she thought it, uh, the actors and the director did a pretty good job at um, presenting the essence of the play, especially uh, the way to play uh, in between the past and the present, the documentary and the reality. She thought it was pretty well done. Rahu 但是因为我访问的人其实都还活着，所以就是他们都还没死，所以我想说，那那我就舍不得把他们写死了，所以就是就是会做有这个演出也是好好奇于说，就是因为我有因为我的朋友是相依伴侣，就是他跟有感染的人交往，然后然后就是但他但他可以给他父母看的影视的作品，就是都是。大家都都是会死的人，这样可能是可能是平常的心，或者是美国天使。OK， 
So, and then um, he, she felt very honored to be invited by the Taipei Culture Center to present the stage reading. She thought it was very meaningful, uh, mainly because uh, the very first production in Taiwan was fully funded by the government, the National Theater. Um, so she then talks about the concept of writing this play. Uh, at first she was thinking about maybe she can do something that was pretty much like uh, Angels in America because in Taiwanese theater, we, are high, we, were, we have been highly influenced by the American theater. So she was thinking about maybe she should do that. However, uh, when she was doing a lot of research on this production, she was thinking, well, these people are still alive. These people that are affected are still alive. I, uh, she doesn't want to write a story about an AIDS patient being dead. So she instead chose to focus on this production and then create this production. And then she also talked about her friend who, who is actually dating an HIV positive uh, partner. And she, she said that according to his friend, he actually had a hard time choosing what kind of TV shows or what kind of uh, performing arts to show to his parents. Because a lot of times, like the show Normal Heart or Angels in America, we oftentimes talk about the death that was caused by uh, AIDS. Thank you. So <clears throat> maybe we, um, um, we come back to you later. So we go to um, Paul Chang. And um, how, did, how did it feel for you to perform your work? Um, um, I have to close here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, um, it's, it's, it's actually my first time doing a stage reading of this play. Um, this play was um, first um, performed in um, Edinburgh Fringe Festival in 2016, and uh, we've been doing the shows for 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 quite a few times. And uh, but but in my um, theater career, I've never done any like stage reading, so I was actually very very excited, um, and I'm so lucky and so blessed to have Surya as a dramaturg to help me out with to start out all these things. Um, yeah, I, I actually I. I I would like to ask all of you because I couldn't speak for myself. I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to find the balance. I mean, technically, trying to find the balance in stage reading, not to, not to give out too much to leave some space for the audience to come in. Is very philosophic, philosophical thoughts, but um, I, I actually don't know how it works. But um, I, I truly, truly enjoyed it. So I hope you did as well. Tell us a bit about the the idea of the artificial intelligence and the hidden worlds and the identity. What is what was your inspiration and what are you struggling with for writing the play? Um, I I actually um, uh, I'm actually a theater director who hates multimedia very much, <laughs> using using that elements in, in in my work because I I'm I, I'm always afraid that it would take the the warmth of the theater or the authenticity of theater. Uh, but this project was uh, sort of like a, a commissioned by a project called QA Ring in Taipei. And the bottom line is that you have to write a play collaborating with any forms of modern media. So um, my first idea was actually um, trying to find my any, any experience in my personal life that has something to do with that. And interestingly, I realized a fact that I actually like to talk to machines a lot <laughs> than real people. I actually don't like real people. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> I, um, <laughs> uh, mm, actually, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, I actually feel a lot more comfortable leaving voice messages to my friends, and I, I've always I, I, I always do that until one day a friend of mine told me, stop sending me voice messages. Why can't you just give me a call and just talk to me? And I was like, okay, so, so a lot of people don't like it. Hmm, interesting. And why do I like it so much? Why, what am I afraid of? This real connection with people. Why do I enjoy voice message so much? So I started from here, it's starting point, and to to think, oh, what, what happened with us, our generation in this world? Maybe technology, as we all know, um, doesn't really um, brought it, we, we are we closer 
most of most of the time we're more alienated than each other. Um, so I got this idea here. I want to write something about being in love with a machine or talking a lot with a machine because it happens, and I can certainly identify that to it. So I start from that, and then another idea um, came in. That is. Um, I was really intrigued by a tagline by a movie or something. It says, how do you live without someone you love? And I, I feel strongly about this tagline because we all have this experience. And take myself, for example, I was brought up by my grandmother mostly, so uh, we are very close. And I, I actually, I miss her all the time, very much. And in Taiwan, we have this Taoist ritual. Uh, we call Guan Luoying. You can actually practice this ritual and then we believe that, actually I've never done that, but um, I'm very intrigued by that ceremony. So I did some research and uh, it says through the ritual you can actually go to the underworld to meet someone. Die, uh, yeah, you, you, someone who has left. Um, so I decided to combine these two things together because I believe that when we can't find answers through religion, we seek for help from the technology and vice versa. So I think these two things can be really interesting to mingle with. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started to this. Yeah, we will thank you. And um, Li Ying, we come back to you. Uh, Surya, as a dramaturg, you worked on the play. What were challenges to adapt it for a New York audience? Is it a New York play? Uh, could sure. it in any way? And, um, and how was that in uh, cutting it down? Yeah, um, well, I mean, w one of the biggest challenges, of course, in, you know, I had the privilege of watching some clips of the full-fledged, you know, production, and I saw that technology figured quite a, in a big way into kind of the, like, uh, the craft of the play, uh, as, as you see it on the stage. Um, and I knew that it was important that we incorporate um, some technology uh, in the telling of the story. And, um, you know, I, I, one of the first things that we had a conversation about, Pao and I, was how can we really, really kind of um, use technology in a really, really kind of effective way to, to tell the story and uh, really, really kind of uh, uh, highlight some key moments. Um, and so that was a, 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 a challenge. Um, and I think that also, uh, you know, I, I, I uh, you know, this, this, the story, I, I, I think that it's, it's a universal story in a lot of ways in that it's a story about love and it's a story about longing and it's a story about death. It's a story about sexuality. Um, and so I think that um, I think that it is uh, it, it could very well play to an American audience because uh, a, a lot of American plays by American writers deal with those uh, themes in their works. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it was just a real privilege to be able to uh, uh, work on this piece with Powell. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, before we uh, go to Knut about directing, maybe um, um, uh, uh, Liying, one more for you, one more question. Tell us a bit about the inspiration for the shelter. What was your technique? How did you do interviews, or did you imagine it? How, what was the idea, the inspiration, and how did you create the play? Uh, 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 就是因為我是訪談很多人所以他就是他是其實是一個一個訪談的形式然後就這這邊他是在拍拍紀錄片然後他同時因為他拍拍紀錄片因為我們演出現場是有用那個現場的投影所以其實紀錄片這個形式也
Um, that's why in the very first production, you would be able to see the documentary as the format for this entire production. And you will be able to see the projection, and then that projection actually helps to, you know, go going back and forth, the past and the present. Um, and the story is actually uh, starting from late 1990s to early uh, 2000s. And uh,然后就因为是要去谈一个每个人,这个人可能会去回避的一个过去,所以是使用一个这样纪录片的一个形式。我觉得我本身要说这个结构是 是从一个秘鲁的小说家来的<笑><笑> So um, she wants to um, talk about how one person recollects his memory. Uh, through this production. Oftentimes when we try to recall our own memories, uh, we will recall something that can be very important to us, but not necessarily to other people. And oftentimes we also avoid certain things. And that is why she adapted this idea of using the documentary. And she was also taking, talking about the inspiration from, in terms of the structure of the entire production, she was talking about the inspiration from a Peruvian novelist who won uh, the Nobel Prize in year 2009. And we don't know how to translate his name, <laughs> unfortunately. Marcus Losa, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and uh, Knut, what were the challenges um, in, in directing, uh, immorally asking to do a 30 minutes anyway, but um, so how did you see the work? Uh, it, was, it was, the challenge I think was for me, what I do um, year round is as I, uh, as a director of new work here in the city, uh, I work hand in hand with playwrights and they're almost always in the room with me and we're sort of exploring together and and this was a, a fun challenge in that it was, um, I, felt like, I felt like there were several acts of translation happening where, uh, you know, the, the play newly translated to English, me selecting uh, an excerpt of that play is a, a sort of an act of uh, translation or, or a, a lens of editing. Uh, and then, yeah, and then working with uh, actors for, for a brief four hours today, trying to um, interpret it or, or give it a little, a little uh, life, a little suggestion of, wh of what the play promises in production. Uh, and then finally, the, the reading format itself, a play reading is, is already a sort of a, a, a transformation of um, media and of expression and, and trying to hint at the, the fullness of the play, which is... Um, uh, has a has a media component has a, has a really uh, vast canopy of, of a canvas of characters of of realities in and out of time it's it's ambitious and and sprawling and um, has a great size of story so so trying to trying to capture that fullness of, of narrative through these various steps of translation with um, Archimedes actors who were kind enough to give their time today was was a fun challenge for me. Thank you, and I think you know we got a felt got a feeling for that place where that all happened. Um, um, so um, you, uh, you, you, uh, you, a part of comparative literature world. Um, how does this literature we heard, or the words, how do how do they compare um, to 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 um, to adaptation, to translation, and is it successful? Um, compare those two plays. For tonight, I think uh, from Poe's solo day to it somehow speak to uh, Lin's work, the possible memoir of Mami, uh, because they both touch on certain kind of issue on adaptation and also translation, transcultural, transcultural media, and also this kind of transmedia uh, interplay. You you see this kind of idea when Poe. Poe's work is obviously 
made for translation. He has this idea of a global audience in mind. So you can see he play with different kind of mediums and languages. He switched between four different uh, four different languages. Taiwanese.